I'm James P. Friel. And I'm Dean Holland. It's time to fasten your seatbelts, boys and girls. That's right. If you're an entrepreneur who's wanting to take your business to the next level and have a bit of fun while getting cutting edge advice on your business, marketing, and sales, welcome to Just the Tips, arguably the best podcast in the entire world. I guess that's good, right? Yeah, sounds good to me. All right. That was easy. That was the easiest thing we did all day. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Just the Tips. This is your host, James P. Friel. I am thrilled that you guys are here with us today. I am not broadcasting from my home studio. I'm on a covert mission opening a new business, Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We actually have a super, super exciting show lined up for you guys to talk about a topic that every single business owner needs to be thinking about before it's too late. But before we start that conversation, I just saw him crest the horizon on his white noble steed coming into the studio, the one, the only bearded wonder from the United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Mr. Dean Holland. Oh, oh, you're wearing this. Yes, I think too. (laughs) Um, so I got word, Dean, about like literally five minutes before we just started the show, the trumpeteers who usually announce your entrance, um, have come down with something and they're suffering a cold today. And so I apologize that we didn't give you the usual fanfare that you're accustomed to. Is there no part of the world this pandemic won't ruin? No, it's not. Even this has got way out of hand now. Lock me in my house. Throw away the key, but do not take away my trumpets. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, how's it going, man? Yeah, I'm awesome, dude. How are you doing? It's uh, good. it's good to see you on the road. JTT on tour right That's now. Right. JTT on tour. Now, I was like trying to figure out. I was like, all right, can I make this happen? And um, as you know, I am uh, I'm opening a chain of restaurants here in Florida. Yeah. Uh, do with- I know this is my favorite subject: food yes. and business. This yes. like. It's a win. It's a win. Yeah. Now we're pretty. Yeah, uh, we're pretty pumped. So I'm down here uh, working on that stuff. But the today we have an extraordinary guest um, who's talking about a topic that I feel too few people are addressing. So in the entrepreneurial world, everyone's talking about you know how to grow your business, how to scale your business, how to you know get more customers, and all those things are super important. But there are very few people who are talking about what do you do with your business when right you're ready to exit. Like, how do you exit? How do you prepare to exit? How do you do all these things? So we have an amazing guest. um, And I'm just going to pull it right in the show. Michelle Tyler, Siler Tucker. Sorry, I got tongue twisted there. (laughs) How are you? Author of the upcoming book, Exit Rich, um, forward by Kevin Harrington. Uh, Michelle's the real deal. She's here to talk to us today about how to sell your business for big profits and how to get your business ready for selling, even if you don't want to sell it so that it's more valuable. Ooh, what a topic. Michelle, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here with us. And uh, thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks, Dean, for having me. You know, I want the shirt. Where's my shirt? You're going to get one. <laughs> oh, you're already on the list. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Oh, forget about cool. exiting rich. You're about to wear rich. This and you might even get an real extra, deal. <laughs> you might even get an extra shirt if you, because uh, Michelle, before the show, I'm going to just be real here. She said she liked Dean better than me. And now that it hurt my feelings. And so Dean's going to have to figure out how to get her shirt. And he has no idea how to do that. So, <laughs> but I like the accent. That's all. All right. All right. Yeah, the person yeah, the person behind it is an absolute ass. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. You may have salvaged your t-shirt. So Michelle, seriously, yeah. I, um, you know, I said it a minute ago, but I don't feel like enough people are talking about this topic that you're championing, right? Like, Everyone's out there hustling and grinding and doing all these different things to build their business. And at some point, they're like, what do I want to do? Like, do I want to keep it? Do I want to sell it? And at that point, there's not enough people who are giving the kind of advice that you're giving. And Mm -hmm. so my first question is, like, why do you think this is such an important topic for entrepreneurs to be thinking about, even if they have no intention of selling right now or for a long time? So I'll give you two big reasons for that. Number one, when I wrote my very first book, Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth in 2013, and did the research, I learned that 95% of all startups would fail within the first one to five years. We all know that, right? That's Mm -hmm. common knowledge. But here's what you don't know. When I wrote Exit Rich in 2019-2020 with Sharon Lecter, I did the exact same research and learned that the business landscape has actually flip-flopped. And this is way before the pandemic. 
Now it's only 30% of startups, one to five years, will go out of business. Only 30%. So you're going nice. to do great on those restaurants, Steve. You know, you're going to do very good on those restaurants, right? Nice. <laughs> but listen to this. This is where it gets scary. Out of 27.6 million companies, those businesses that have been in business for 10 years or longer, 70% are at risk of going out of business. Mm -hmm. 70. So you hear about the big public companies on the media, you know, on TV all the time. Toys R Us in business 75 years goes out of business, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Blockbuster obviously goes out of business, but JC Penney's is in trouble. Montgomery Wards, Dimark goes out of business. Pier One, Jamboree, Radio Shack. You got um, Godiva, our favorite chocolate, closing down 1,500 locations. GNC closing down 900 locations. But what you're not hearing about all the private businesses on every street corner in every town in every state across America, these business owners are exiting poor. They're selling for pennies on a dollar, closing their business, or even worse, filing bankruptcy. And mm -hmm. when you file bankruptcy in America, you don't just lose your business assets, you lose your personal assets too, because most business owners pierce the corporate veil. So that's a huge issue. And on top of that, Steve Forbes, who endorsed Exit Rich, says 80% of businesses will not sell. Eight out of 10 companies will not sell. So if you got 70% of businesses going out of business, and 80% not selling. Don't you think that this is a huge topic that every business owner needs to know about? I, I couldn't agree more. I absolutely couldn't agree more. I think there's so much uh, there's so much mystery around how this works for most entrepreneurs. It's It feels really daunting. It feels really scary. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are not even thinking about this. I don't think, uh, I think in some part because they're almost hiding from the idea that I could sell my business or it just is like, it feels too complicated. Cause they're like, I'm going to need an army of lawyers and I'm going to need an army of accountants and all these people to help me figure this out. And, um, and it's, it's, it's important though, right? For the amount, for all the entrepreneurs that I know, people are putting in, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week to grow their business and right. to, not, to not set themselves up for success in the future um, I, I think it's kind of, I think it's scarier to not set yourself up for the future than to figure out the nuts and bolts on how you do exactly what you're talking about. Right. And I don't really think it's so much about them going, Oh my God, it's too much for me to do. It's more of a denial where the number one reason why businesses don't sell is because business owners just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. They don't think about it until an internal or external catastrophic event has occurred. Mm -hmm. Internal meaning health issues, partners dispute, divorce, death. You know, external is this pandemic. And the, the worst time to sell your business is during a catastrophic event. And when right. they think about selling, when they think about it during a catastrophic event, they want premium price for their mm -hmm. business, but they really haven't built their business to where buyers really want to pay them premium price. And most business owners will say, look, I want $10 million for my company or $20 million for my company. And their EBITDA is 100000 <laughs> And I ask them, how'd you come up with that price? because that's what they want. They need to retire on, or that's what they need to buy another business or create their next masterpiece. So business owners are not thinking about it until they get burned out until there's a health issue or something like that. Look, I had a sweet little old lady call me a couple months ago. She said, can you please sell my husband's business? He dropped dead from a heart attack. He's been in business 45 years, left me with a pile of debt. She says, I know nothing about the financials or the business. And he had a construction company. He had all subcontractors, so he had no people. And we talk about the six P's, how you have to build your business on you know, the six P's that solid infrastructure. He had no people, he had subcontractors and all the data was in his head. So when he died, the business died. Mm -hmm. And that happens over and over and over again. And that's the second reason that businesses don't sell is because they're a thousand percent dependent upon the owner. I pulled the owner out, there is no business. So yeah. true, yeah, so true. Can you imagine eight out of 10 businesses won't sell? Imagine buying a house and knowing there's an 80% chance you're never gonna be able to sell it if you want to. Oof. Right. That was, uh, I didn't want to move there. No, nobody <laughs> wants to move there. But like every single person, like 80 percent of entrepreneurs are doing that to themselves. They're moving into a house that nobody's ever going to buy. But that's right. That's yeah, right. That's right. And then they're going to they're going to love they're going to be left with an asset they can't sell, mm -hmm. you know, or they're going to end up out of business like the 70 percent that I talked about. The number one reason that 70 percent of businesses are going out of business is because of lack of aim and aim is always innovate and market. 
business owners stop innovating, they stop marketing. So true. Now, especially the ones that have been in business 10, 15, 20, 30 years, their customers are also aging out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you got to make sure you replace your customer base, but you always got to innovate, you know? Yeah, you know, right. Innovation right, so, is key. So, so, all right. So we, I think we set the stage for yeah. why you should listen to this. Okay. But I want to make sure that people who are listening, you know, not only like my, like our goal with having you on the show, Michelle, was one, create awareness around mm -hmm. this topic, right? Because I think your, that's your whole mission is to create awareness around mm -hmm. this and come and help people with a solution mm -hmm. to a problem that you know, like with certainty is they're going to run into. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that was number one, but number two, give them some ideas and some strategies and dare I say some tips, that's the tips, right? Um, <laughs> give them some tips to be able to navigate this so what are some of the things that these business owners and entrepreneurs should be thinking about now, even if the idea of an exit is at some point in the future? So the big thing I tell everybody, and look, I'm going to give you lots of tips. So you better have a pen and paper ready and pack a lunch. We're ready. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. But first <laughs> and foremost, we have to start with changing the mindset mm. because Business owner's mindset is, oh my God, this is my baby. This is my baby. This is my baby. I'm never going to want to sell my baby. That's ridiculous. Your baby's at home. Go home and hug and kiss your babies. Your business is not your baby. Your business is your most valuable asset. You need to treat it as such. You know, you don't want to go home and kiss your financial portfolio, right? <laughs> <laughs> so build your business to sell. And I call this the GPS exit model. This is tip number one. Follow the GPS exit model. When you want to drive somewhere, Dean, when you want to drive somewhere in London, what do you do? Get a or GPS wherever you are. You put, yeah. you put your GPS out. And what do you plug right. in? What do you plug the in? Coordinates, where I'm going. The destination. Destination, that's it. Right. Yes. So you got to plug in a destination. And James, that's a problem with most business owners. They have no destination. Yeah. And business yeah. owners, don't they don't fail the plan. I mean, they don't plan to fail. They fail the plan. So most business owners have no destination. So they're driving around in circles, driving up and down the financial hills. They end up broke. Mm -hmm. So the destination is key from day one of starting or buying your business. Even if you've been in business 10 years and you don't have a destination, let's figure it out right now. So your destination is your desired sales price. Pick a number. What do you want to sell your business for? Everybody gets hung up on a number. Mm -hmm. Just pick a number. You might make it. You might not. It doesn't matter. You got to get started. So mm -hmm. let's say you want to sell for $20 million, right? There's a number. $20 million? We in agreement? Okay. Then what do you? What does the GPS exit model need to know next? When? Where you're starting? Yeah. Oh, from. Yeah. What's your current location? Right. What is your current evaluation? Now, here's where most business owners also get stuck. Most business owners have never had their business evaluated. That's financial suicide. You know, we go to the doctor once a year to make sure our heart's still ticking and we're still kicking. We take our car to the mechanic once a year to get an annual tune-up. But we don't get an annual valuation checkup mm -hmm. on our business. And there are events that increase valuation. There are events like this pandemic that decrease valuation. You always need to know what your business is worth. Your business could be worth five million one year, and next year it could be worth maybe four million. Right. I so, imagine there's a lot of fear around facing up to that. I bet that's why a lot don't do it. Right. It's like you yeah, find but get over the fear got a lump, because let's check it out. <laughs> you got to get over the fear because the bottom line is you can't fix what you don't know. True. Yeah. So if you want to sell for twenty million dollars, you need to know what your business is worth today. Let's say it's worth five million dollars. The next thing you need to know is time frame. So let's say you want to do this in 10 years. You could expand it, you know, but this is just a start of a plan, right? So let's say you want to sell for $20 million. You're currently worth 10 million. I'm sorry, 5 million. And you want, look, I already gave you a raise. I love you it. Want to I do wherever, wherever, however this is working, I like this. It's like <laughs> yeah. five minutes ago worth five, now worth 10. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> and we're, we're going to do this in 10 years. Now, the next equation you need to know is who my buyers are going to be. Yeah. Who my buyers are going to be. And a lot of our, a lot of sellers come to me and say, Michelle, I just need you to represent me. I have one buyer. One buyer? That's insane. I'm never going to let you do that mm -hmm. because of two reasons. Number one, we're not going to put all of our eggs in one buyer's basket. 
because the likelihood of that buyer closing on your business is slim to none. And then we have no backup buyers. Plus, how do we maximize value if we can't create competition? Yeah. yeah. We yeah. got to create competition to get you the highest price possible. So there's five types of buyers. So if you want to sell for $20 million, 90% of buyers are first time buyers. They're not buying a $20 million company. Right? They buy very small businesses, mm. uh, typically under half a million dollars. The next type of buyer is turnaround specialists. They buy distressed assets. They're not buying your company. Mm -hmm. Third type of buyer is PEGs, private equity groups. They buy two ways, platforms and add-ons. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So a platform is, let's say they want to get into um, staffing and they don't have any staffing companies, mm -hmm. industrial staffing. They won't even look at your company unless you're at $3 million to $5 million in EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. But let's say they're already in staffing and they're looking for smaller staffing companies. Then we'll look, they'll look at it EBITDA under a million. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And a fourth type of buyer is competitors slash strategics. Strategics typically pay the highest multiple because they're buying synergies. They're taking advantage of economies of scale. And they're looking for what they can cut from an infrastructure standpoint so they can increase EBITDA from day one. And then the last type of buyer is a sophisticated serial entrepreneur who's industry agnostic. They chase EBITDA. They chase cash flow. So you say, okay, I want to sell a $20 million company. It's going to be those three types of buyers, right? Mm -hmm. Now you need to like reverse engineer your plan and figure out where do your financials have to be? To be attractive to that type of buyer. To and be attracted to that type of buyer, but to also get an ROI. So if you want to sell for $20 million, you need to know where's your gross revenue, your, your profit margins. Most importantly, where's your EBITDA need to be? To mm -hmm. sell for $20 million, you need to have an EBITDA of 4 to $5 million. Mm -hmm. 4 to $5 million. Then you need to find out well, what's your synergies? Like, what are they looking for? And build your business to, to meet their specific criteria. It's kind of like, James, you're opening up these restaurants in Orlando. Do you know your target audience? Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? You already know your target audience. You're building these restaurants to suit your target audience's criteria, right? Yeah. Same thing with building your business to suit your buyer of your business's criteria. Make right. sense? I, I was about to say this process here and you explain it, it's, it's identical in, in so many similarities in the way of we would sit down and say, right, who's our dream customer? Like what Same product way. are we selling? What, what earnings per customer do we need to reach? How many customers to reach our goals? You know, you're going for the same approach in, in many respects here. Right? It's the exact same thing, but nobody thinks of it like this. Yeah. And nobody builds it like this. Nobody plans it like this, but it's the exact same thing. And then the last step in the equation is why? <laughs> why? You know, your why has to be powerful enough to keep you in the game. If it was easy to sell a $20 million company, everybody would be doing it. Yeah, exactly. So your wife's got to be powerful enough to help you weather all the financial storms that are going to come your way. Then well, the next all, thing the, all the ins and outs and the process. And it's like, you know, cause what you're talking about, you have the destination, you know, where you're starting, you have a time frame in mind. That's like, that's the framework of the plan. Then you got to actually like do the work to make all of that happen. So you have to have a big why. You have to have a big why. Cause then you can be like trucking right along, making your goals and bam, here comes a pandemic. <laughs> Here comes a guy with a British accent. You start doing a podcast with him for four Yeah, this says process. <laughs> <It> says process. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle, I got to ask, how did, why this? Like you're, you know, you're a seasoned uh, business professional. Like, you know, the ins and outs. Of, like, why, why is this the thing that you're doing? Like, what's your why? Oh my gosh. I'm just, I love entrepreneurship since I was a little kid. I had different types of businesses. So I live, breathe, you know, sleep entrepreneurship. I'm like a kid in a candy store. The thing that gets me the most excited is to find out how, you know, an entrepreneur started their, like we're selling a, a company right now for $70 million and the owner has an eighth grade education and he started his business out of his pickup truck. No kidding. That's and awesome. so just, I love stuff like that. And I just think entrepreneurship is alive and well, but the problem in America is that, Small, you know, there's 30.2 million businesses in the United States. Small business is a backbone of our economy and employing over half the U.S. workforce. If we lose small business, like 70% of businesses are going out of business, we lose jobs. You lose jobs, you lose spending power, you lose spending power, and then you lose more small businesses. It's a trickle-down effect. So mm -hmm. my, my passion and mission 
is to really save America's economy by saving small business, saving one business at a time from going out of business. Yeah, no, I, I, we share that so much. Like that's exactly the way I feel. And I know Dean feels too. Um, I'm curious, what was your first business as a little kid? My first business as a little kid was just your typical little lemonade stand, <laughs> you know, and, and then just doing chores for people saying, oh, look, I'll do this, pay me this, I'll do that, pay me this. But yeah. um, pretty young, I, I had an event company and then I had a magazine business and, you know, then I've just kind of had lots of other businesses. You know, before I did mergers and acquisitions, <clears throat> you're going to find this interesting because of your restaurants. I did franchise sales, franchise development, and franchise consulting. All right. I was an equity wow. partner with several different franchisors, and I've sold hundreds upon hundreds of franchises. Nice. Well, so I know a lot about the franchise world. I love that. Awesome. I uh, yeah. Well, it's it's always so it's always so interesting to find out everybody's backstory and like where they've come from and what they're doing. But I think you know to that you like you've you've been in the business world in this game for your entire career. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And that's and that's exactly why, you know, Dean and I want to have Michelle on the show, you guys, because it's like this is not this is not theoretical stuff, right? This is like practical in you know, battle tested strategies to help you protect the biggest asset that you have, which is your business. Like you wouldn't, you know, just like, you know, move into your house and not get insurance on it and let it go and all this other stuff. Like you gotta you got to protect your business too, because that's where all your time is going. Um, yeah. Dean, uh, I'm uh, I'm hogging the mic as usual. What no, uh, I, comments or questions do you have for Michelle? Yeah, so I, I would love to know. So being somebody, you know, we've started, you know, our cosmetics company. Let's take it from this perspective. You know, like I haven't, you know, I've thought in my own head, like, oh yeah, this could be a company that that becomes huge and sells one day. Like listening to you there, like I've I've not done those things. It's just a thought in my head. So is this something, you know, if somebody's like me that they haven't done this process, is this a case now of, okay, just kind of pause right now and go through these steps you've just said. And what about also maybe somebody hasn't even started their business yet. They've got their mm -hmm. idea, their very new startup phase. When is the time to do this? Is this a case of like, you should be doing this right from the start or do we need to get moving first? Do we need to reach a certain point? Well, I think, you know, with your cosmetic company, you've already started, right? Correct. Yeah. How many years? Uh, Four. Oh yeah, you should definitely be doing this. <laughs> You're four years late. <laughs> yeah, well, that's so the question, right? I'm already behind on this. Starting a business or buying a business. Now, if you just have an idea and you really haven't started, you know, kind of start getting that idea into fruition and start opening up your business. I think it's important to also take your listeners real quick if we have time to what I call the six P's, which is the I'd infrastructure. Absolutely. Because the infrastructure is so important. Like this GPS is extremely important because like I said, you have to have a plan, right? Every right. business that I partner with, because I partner with business owners, investing my time, energy, money, resources, expertise. I help fix their business, help grow their business. And I put them on a build to sell plan where we exit in three to five years. If they can't get clear on this vision, then I'm not going to partner with them. Same mm -hmm. thing on buying businesses. I buy businesses and flip them. Um, so you really should be thinking about this right now, Dean, and all of your listeners should stop, pause, and start writing these ideas down and, you know, what's their desired price tag? What are they worth right? They might be worth zero right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can adjust your sales along the way. You don't have to stay at that number, but you just want to get started somewhere. Yeah. Um, yep. but so just, tell us about the six P's. Yeah. yeah. So the six P's are, are huge. I mean, this is what will make or break your company. This is what, this is the difference between a sellable business and a not sellable business. So the number one P is people. You don't build a business, you build people and they build the business. Mm. And the number two reason why businesses don't sell is because the business is a thousand percent dependent upon the owner. Mm -hmm. I pull the owner out and there is no business. I had a dentist that came to me, wants to sell one dentist, been in business 50 years, three dental hygienists. And by the way, the three dental hygienists are his family members. Right. <laughs> so I said, look, I can sell your business. We're not going to maximize value, but I can still sell it. But you have to stay on for two to three years. He goes, I'm burned out. I'm not staying. I said, well, if you're not staying, you're not selling. Because the minute you leave, your patients leave. So people's huge. Entrepreneurs have to focus on their strengths, hire their weaknesses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and put the pe right people in the right seats, and then ask the who question. 
Who opens the door? Who handles customer service, marketing, legal, accounting, manufacturing, distribution, quality control, environmental? The clue here, James and Dean, is you should not be next to the who. Because the business needs to run without you. This yeah. is another place where you pause. <laughs> and you write down all the who's and put the names next to each who to make sure that the business can run without you because that is the number one reason why businesses don't sell. In addition to that, if you're trying to sell a company for five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars, you better have a layer of management in between. Mm -hmm. You gotta have that COO, you gotta have that CFO, that CTO. Make sense? Yeah. So people, people is the biggest challenge and the hardest P to really keep up with. Well, Warren Buffett said, uh, business is easy. It's the people stuff that's hard. No, I agree with Warren Buffett. A thousand percent. With in fact, I call him an exit rich numerous times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so, so people. People and then product. Product, okay. So let me, can I explain each one? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So product is your industry, your service. You need to ask yourself your product, like your cosmetic company. Dean, is it on the way up or is it on the way out? Is it thriving or is it dying? Do you have an Amazon on your hands and you're going to be in your prime? Or do you have a blockbuster and you're about to go bust? And because of this pandemic, there's so many industries that were once thriving that are now dying mm -hmm. and vice versa. So I tell all of my clients, ask yourself these three questions. Amazon did this back in the 90s. Amazon asked themselves, what business are we in? Yeah. And I said, we're in a book selling business. We sell books. Everybody should be asking themselves, what business are we in? The second question Amazon asks is, what do we do really well? What's our core competency? What do we do better than everybody else? What is our USP, our unique selling proposition? And Amazon said, you know what we do better than everybody else? We do fulfillment better. Mm -hmm. The third obvious question is, what business should we be in? Mm -hmm. Should. And Amazon said, we should be in a fulfillment business, fulfilling everybody's products, not just books. Those three transformational questions transformed Amazon from a small bookseller to a multi-billion dollar worldwide conglomerate they are today. So these are transformational. So many business owners get tied up in the transactional where they're putting out fires every day, where they have, you know, their hand in every pot. You got to stop doing that. You got to work on the business, not in the business. Yeah. And ask yourself those three transformational questions. Another place where you pause. Yeah. Nice and then... The, the third P is processes. Now, we all know in order to sustain, have a sustainable business that you can scale, you have to have processes, right? But processes are kind of like exit strategies. Business owners don't think about them until ba something bad happened in their company and they're like, oh, we need a process for that. Yeah. I mean, we were selling a manufacturing business and an employee got hurt on the manufacturing floor and lost a limb, catastrophic event. The lawsuits are coming down. The business owners had to file bankruptcy while we're trying to sell the company. And he said, Michelle, we need a process for health and safety on a manufacturing floor. I'm like, you think you needed that before? <laughs> exactly. No way. Yeah, a way. <laughs> I could write a book on stuff like this, you know, just alone. Yeah. And then, um, so processes, Dean, this is where most companies get it wrong. You always need to design your processes around the customer experience. Not around the owner's agenda. I'll give you an example. McDonald's back in the 50s. Did y'all watch the movie, The Founder? Great. Yeah. The McDonald Brothers. Best yeah. movie ever, right? So good. So, yeah. McDonald Brothers back in the 50s said, we want to create a fast food restaurant and we want this fast system processes designed around the customer experience. We want our customers to experience great tasting food that's fast, it's hot, 30 seconds or less. You remember that? Yep. Yeah. Remember when they went out to the tennis courts and took all the employees and took the chalk and mapped it all out? And then one of the McDonald brothers was up on the ladder, like conducting everybody. And until they created a symphony yeah. of processes that you can eat at a McDonald's anywhere in the world and get the same experience, right? Because it was designed with the customer experience in mind. Totally. And they didn't just, they weren't like, oh, this is the first process. In that scene, they like, erased everything off tennis court a couple yeah. times. They're like, it's not yeah. right yet. It's not right yet. And that's like, that's exactly right. You got it. And they did that all day. All day. Or all who knows days. how many days, right? It was just yeah. like until they got the result that they wanted. 
Right. And I, I so appreciate what you're saying around creating process around the customer experience mm-hmm. because that's who pays the bills. Like that's who's going to increase the value of your company. Right. Like, well, if, you want, like, you have. if you want raving fans, raving fans, you have to get this piece right. Because if you don't design it with the customer experience in mind, you're going to have the opposite. And if you don't, if you don't design wow experiences for your customers, somebody else will. Yes. And have you ever, James, have you ever had an incident where where you have a problem with a retailer, a bank, a social media company, and you've talked to like five, six, seven people, and you have to tell your story over and over and over again to get some sort of resolve? It's miserable. It's miserable. Or if you call a bank and you have to push all these prompts, or let's say you want to go to a chiropractor. My hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday from nine to 12. But I come back at three or there to five. I mean, those processes are designed around the owner. And I can say that because my husband's a chiropractor. But those processes are designed around the owner's agenda, not around the customer experience, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, they got to be, they have to be productive and efficient and well documented. Here's what most companies also get it wrong. You know how many companies don't have policy and procedure manuals or SOP checklist? It's crazy. So you got to have those policy and procedure manuals. McDonald's can fire somebody and within 30 minutes have somebody at that front read the SOP checklist and serve it and working and yeah. servicing customers. And then you also have to make sure you have employee handbooks, employee contracts, non-competes. All your, all, everything has to be papered. Make sense? I think when people hear this, they're like, yeah, that makes sense. And then they kind of forget about it because it feels like a lot of work and they don't know where to start. And yeah. And, well, and I think they also, they also think like, oh, man, it's if I don't have it all the way done, then I'm not going to worry about it. And, you know, Dean knows that one of the things that I talk about a lot is good, better, best. It's like just start, like get mm-hmm. something going and then improve upon it. And this is not a this isn't an overnight thing. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like you're building the asset. Like, this is ongoing. Like you should have a policy and procedure manual open up in your company. And when something different happens or something unique, there's a policy and procedure for that. And somebody goes and records it. This is an ongoing process, but it's kind of like the exit strategy. When I said, just pick a number, you got to start somewhere. That's right. And the easiest place to do, the easiest place to start is to have a meeting with, with your people and ask them, what do we want our customers to experience? Mm -hmm. What do we want our customers to walk away feeling? How do we create that wow experience here? Because every wow experience moves you up the branding ladder. Every unwow moves you down the branding ladder. Yes. I will yeah. talk about branding in a minute. So you got to start somewhere. You know, like I said, people is the hardest. Processes is just always forever on. You know, it's forever going. So what you got to be tweaking along the way. Absolutely. All right. So we got we got people, product, process. What's next? So the next P, which is proprietary, is the highest value driver. Mm-hmm. So let's, let me give you a crash course on evaluations. Businesses that have less than a million dollars in EBITDA will typically trade from anywhere from one to three, maybe four if they got some of these proprietary assets. Businesses over a million dollars in EBITDA, typically five and up. Mm. And these proprietary assets is the highest multiple driver of any other P. There are six pillars to proprietary. The other two P's are quick. Six pillars. Do you got time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's hear okay. it. So number one, let's talk about branding. Remember the branding ladder? Do you want me to tell you about the branding ladder real quick? Yeah, 95% of businesses yeah. live, 95% of businesses live in brand absence. Yeah. Where consumers have no idea who you are and what you do. Then you go from, and every wow moves you up the branding ladder, every unwell moves you down. Then you go from brand absence to brand awareness to where consumers at least know of your products and services. Then you go from brand awareness to brand preference. That's where I say I prefer Coke over Pepsi. Mm-hmm. And then you go from brand brand preference to brand assistance. You know, I used to speak a lot before this pandemic and I stayed at a lot of different hotels and I would always order a Diet Coke. I'm like, well, is Pepsi okay? No, Pepsi's not okay. If Pepsi was okay, I would have ordered a freaking Pepsi. <laughs> and so brand assistance is where I say I only drink Coke. I will never drink Pepsi. That's brand assistance. Right. Yeah. Brand advocacy is where every business owner should strive to get. Brand advocacy 
It's when other people are selling you and talking about you. It's always better when somebody else sells you, sells you instead of you selling yourself, right? Yeah. All right. Well, brand yeah. advocacy is when I say, James, go Google this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dean, you go Xerox this. Yeah. Well, chill yeah. out, you guys. Have a Coke. You know? So yeah. that's brand advocacy. You know, I always say we only we only buy Apple. Everybody that works for me has to have an iPhone. Right. That's brand advocacy. Yeah. Or something current going on. Everyone says we should zoom. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We should yeah. zoom. Yeah. Thank right. you for giving me new content. So, <laughs> so it's really important because here's the bottom line: brand value will drive up the price of your business. I can sell your company for so much more. If you have brand advocacy, you know, people will pay more for branding as long as that brand is relevant in the mind of the consumers. Blockbuster. Is anybody paying any money for Blockbuster? Not no. anymore. Not anymore. The I hear they have one store left somewhere. They do. Oregon. Yeah. The most <laughs> there is one left, Oregon. Only one, I believe. Yeah. The most valuable brand in the world is, you know. Coke? Is it Coke? Coke is in the top 10. They're worth 89 billion. Amazon? Amazon top 10. It's an A though. Apple. Apple. Oh yeah, obviously. $359 billion for just a brand. That's not cash flow, inventory, assets, real estate, accounts receivables. That's just a brand alone. Yeah. $359 billion. So build your brand. Trademarks are also very valuable. Trademarks, company name, slogan, logo, logo, any any of your USPs, like I trademarked Exit Rich, which I was surprised I got that. <laughs> the ST6Ps, you know, the STGPS exit model, your podcast. Did y'all tra federally trademark your podcast? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. So the business, the, the, the most business owners make this mistake though. They go start up a company and they go get the GoDaddy. They go to GoDaddy and they get the domain. They're like, Ooh, Ooh, we got the domain. Let's go to California, set up the business and get a trademark. But guess what they forget to do? They forget to check the federal database to make sure it's available. Yeah. Oh, I could tell you a story on this one. Oh, uh, I got stories too. We've been I got lots of stories where business owners <laughs> yeah. have been in business for, for you know, 10, 15, 20 years, all of a sudden receive a cease and desist letter in the mail, and they have to stop using that company name. Yeah, man, there's yeah. nothing more discouraging than that. Yeah, because, you know, they'll hire an attorney and throw a bunch of money at it, but it's not going to go away. Right, and they have to stop using that company name and start all over. So, Get a federal trademark. And guys, this is for products too. I don't know, um, James, but in this restaurant you're starting, if you have any proprietary products, get mm -hmm. federal trademarks. We have a company that has 12 different products and they have a federal trademark in each. And each product has exclusivity with Walmart, Target, um, TJ Maxx, and other chain stores. That is very valuable. Strategists and competitors will pay a lot of money for that. Yeah. Same thing with patents. You know, if you ever watch Shark Tank, every shark asks the same question. They sound like a broken record. Do you have a patent on that? Yeah. Do you have a pending patent? Do you have a utility patent? In fact, their offers are contingent upon you proving that you have a patent. You know, we sold a company for $18 million that wasn't making very much money, but it had 18 patents. Yeah. And yeah. then contracts are huge. Manufacturing contracts, vendor contracts, distribution contracts, any type of exclusive contracts. Franchising mm -hmm. is huge. Franchise who has franch a franchise or who has franchisees and has those contracts. Client contracts are the most valuable because buyers want to make sure there's money coming in, especially if you have a subscription model with reoccurring revenue. Here's a caveat to contracts. So this is worth a lot of money to you, James. I'm listening. Don't make this Take mistake. Notes, James. You gotta get this. Most business owners leave out the two sentence transferability clause. Right. The contract is transferable on a new entity. In all the years I've been doing this, thousands upon businesses, I have never seen one owner have this. There was an M&A firm that sold to a private equity group. They had 1,500 franchisees. The private equ equity group had a due diligence team. Nobody checked the contracts. The franchisor threw this huge celebratory party, and the franchisees didn't like the private equity group, so they didn't transfer over. And they never went to them ahead of time to get consent to transfer signed. One franchisee transferred. The other ones didn't. Guess what? That private equity group was out of business, filed bankruptcy within 90, 120 days, and sued the entire legal team. Oof. 
99% of sales are asset sales, not stock sales. So if the buyer doesn't agree to do a stock sale and the clients don't agree to consent to transfer, mm -hmm. then your deal can be dead in the water. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, this is, and this is why you need to read this book. Exactly. Right? So yeah. databases, I'm almost done. Databases. What do you yeah. want me to finish or just let's yeah. go? Well, we, got, yeah. we got two P's left. I'm not going to leave it. <laughs> Databases, Facebook paid $19 billion for WhatsApp and WhatsApp was hemorrhaging money, but WhatsApp had a billion users. Mm -hmm. So that is synergy. What we're talking about here are synergies, the strategics, competitors, and pegs will pay a lot of money for. So you got to build your database and make sure it can be retargeted and repurposed. Celebrity endorsements. You know, we have a client that has products with Oprah. Strategists and competitors are going to pay a lot of money for that because they want their products in front of Oprah. Yeah. Radio personalities are also big because they can only endorse one diet company, one skincare, one cosmetic company at a time. I mean, you see Jennifer Aniston's face on Aveeno products. You mm -hmm. don't see it on any other skincare line. Same thing with Cindy Crawford. She endorses rooms to go. Nothing else, right? right. So celebrity endorsements are huge. And then e-commerce, like if you're going to sell some products um, that you sell in your restaurant online, James, those top positions on Wayfair, Etsy, Amazon, eBay, Modern mm -hmm. are huge. Mm -hmm. This is what we call prime real estate that buyers will pay a lot more money for. Yeah. Assets. That's, awesome. That's awesome. What a great, I mean, you, you got like, I could talk to you for hours and hours about this stuff. Like, you know, all of this is so, uh, so fundamental to building a business. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not like I said at the beginning, it's not the stuff that most people are talking about. Like most people are like, oh, like how are we going to run some Facebook ads or how are we going to do this or how are we going to do that? And I'm like, okay, that's all cool stuff. And, it, and it, it's a piece of the puzzle, but like we got to get the big foundational pieces locked and loaded and understand how important they are before we, you know, mess around with all these other details because you could just spend years focusing yeah. on the wrong things and not really have a return to show for it, which is, I think, uh, absolute sad shame. So you got to have this balance of this infrastructure because otherwise you'd just be throwing money at Facebook, trying to get customers in, but you're not going to be sustainable and you're not going to be able to scale. And yeah. obviously you won't be able to sell. Yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. So, so the, the, the um, fifth P is Patreon. So this is your customer base. You know, most businesses follow the 80, 20 rule where 80% of their revenue comes from 20% of their clients. We yeah. had an oil manufacturing business that we were selling at high customer concentration. 70% of their business was tied up in BP. We appraised the company for 9.8 million. We have 550 buyers. We narrowed it down to 12 buyers and we got 12 LOIs, but every single letter of intent had a contingency mm. attached to that BP contract. So if they lost that BP contract, they will lose part of the purchase price yep. because buyers want to mitigate risk. Right. But we found a strategic competitor that has similar products and services, and they've been trying to get in BP for decades and can never get in the door. So they, they knew if they bought this company, not only will they make money here, but they're going to make money over here getting their products and services. So this company paid, offered and paid $15 million for 70% of the company, which is 126% more mm -hmm. than the appraised price. But that's hard to do. We we got lucky <laughs> by finding the right buyer. You really want to make sure you have that customer diversification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the last P, the most important P to all of your listeners is profits. Yeah. Everybody's in business to make money. And people are like, Michelle, why do you put profits last? Because here's why. <laughs> Lack of profits is never the problem. It's always the symptom of yes. not operating one of the other five P's. I have clients that come to me and say, Michelle, I have a profits problem. I'm like, no, you have a people problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you have, you have a process problem. So mm -hmm. lack, of pro lack of profits is never the problem. It's a symptom. If you're running on all five cylinders, all five P's, you will be profitable. I promise you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very well said. So good. So good, Michelle. I can't wait to read your book. So Thank you. I can't wait uh, for you to read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. So speaking of, um, you've got uh, you've got a launch coming up, but you yeah. have something cool that you're doing before the launch, right? I so do. Tell everybody yeah. a little bit about that. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a little bit more about Exit Rich. So Exit Rich is endorsed by Steve Forbes. We said that, right? Kevin Harrington, original Shark on Shark Tank. Did we say Sharon Lecter is my co-author? 
who mentioned wrote, her, she, but it's worth saying again. She's wrote, she wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad with Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, yeah. Lifetime, best time uh, New York one Times. One of the books that, author. that book, like Rich Dad Poor Dad, one of the first books that like significantly changed my life when I was like 18. Yeah. Mine too, actually. Mine too. So, so she's a CPA, a financial literacy expert, the advisor to many different presidents. And her husband just happens to be an intellectual property attorney. So she writes the mentor's corner after each chapter. And then we're endorsed by Jack Canfield from Pick and Soup for the Soul, Mark Ricker Hansen, Brian Tracy, Tom Hopkins, Brad Sugars from Action Coach, and, and a bunch more, Les Brown. Um, so Exit Rich. You can buy it on Amazon, but I would encourage you to go buy it at exitrichbook.com because for $24.79, which is less than Amazon, we will email you the digital download immediately. So you can start reading it now. You don't have to wait till June. We'll ship the hardcover to your doorstep to anyone that lives in the United States. Sorry, Dean, <laughs> for, no, for no additional shipping. And then we will give you a lifetime membership into the Exit Rich Book Club where there's video training. So if you like what you do, if you like what you're hearing here, there's a lot more of me taking deep dives in these different strategies and techniques that I've been doing over the last 20 years in the trenches, plus documents documents to operate your business, documents to sell your business. So we have sample policy and procedure manuals, org charts, employee handbooks, employee non-competes, sample LOIs, letter of intents, purchase agreements, due diligence checklist, and even closing docs. These documents alone, and there's so much more than what I just mentioned, they're there for your review and your download. They will cost you over $30,000 if you want to your attorney to try to recreate, and you can use the templates. For $24.79. Plus, we're going to give you a 30-day free membership in the Club CEOs, which is an entrepreneurship mastermind where we help ask those transformational questions so you too can build that sustainable, scalable business and exit rich one day. Man, there you go. Are you like that's I didn't know you had the uh the templates and the documents and everything in there because you're absolutely right. Like I was if you hadn't said it, I was gonna say those would easily cost tens of thousands of dollars to recreate those. I things. think thirty thousand is probably a low I, estimate. I think you're. I think you're probably <laughs> underestimating it, but let's yeah. just call it that. So, um, yeah, if you guys are listening, I can't encourage you enough to seriously consider this topic that we've been talking about here. Like, right. you're investing your time, your effort, your energy, all of the things that you're doing, your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations, and building this business. Do it in a way that the business serves you. Right, build the business so that it becomes an asset that you can leverage, that you can exit, that you can enjoy. And 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 I think the the whole six P framework that Michelle's been sharing here. I love that you said that profits are the you know the byproduct that there's yeah. the that they, because it's so true. Like mm -hmm. if you if you have the other things right, you will make profits. And so this isn't just about exiting. This is about structuring your business the right way so that you can like really maximize the value that you're getting from it for you while you own it and potentially for a, a new buyer in the future. Um, Dean, any, uh, any parting shots? Or oh, no, I, I would just echo what you're saying there. But I tell you, I, Michelle, I'd love to just fire one quick final question because I know it's on my mind, so it might be on others. Um, is the book, the contents of the book, is it relevant for somebody like me based in the UK? Is, is it going to be oh, still absolutely. national readers? Absolutely, because the principles are worldwide. And I've sold businesses in Canada, Trinidad, Colombia. I've sold businesses in other countries. The principles that we talk about with the six Ps and the GPS exit, they're, they're worldwide. It, it doesn't matter where you're located. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Yeah, no, the principles yeah, are the same. I mean, everything I just said, do you see how you can implement this stuff into your business? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. You answered your own question. There we go. All right. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. There, uh, no, I can safely say, just echoing what James said, like, and, and going in line with your question you just asked me, this has been a great show. It, I think you've given some clear, simple starting points for people to think about. And uh, yeah, just like James said, I think the book now is a natural carry on from listening to this show. So uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Know, a lot of people say, oh my God, Michelle, we covered the whole book. No, we didn't. We covered six chapters. Well, there's even, like 23 chapters that we haven't talked about. Well, and even <laughs> even still, it's like there's there's so much depth to yeah. go into, and the you know all the different things, and uh, it's just it needs to become an important topic mm -hmm. for, for you. Like if you're if you're really like I want to build a business, you cannot build it without thinking about this. It's like it's entrepreneurial malpractice. 
to do that. <laughs> I love that. I'm going I'm to steal that. Yeah, I'm going to steal, steal it too. That. I just came up with it. I'm going to keep using that. Well, but I James trademarked it, guys, last week. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> And James, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said it's not just for selling because it really isn't. You know, exit because you're never going to be able to sell your business unless you've actually built a sellable asset. So exit right. rip is all about building a business that works for you rather than a glorified job that you go to work at every day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the number one thing that I hear from entrepreneurs all over the place, like, is they want freedom, right? They yeah. want time, they want freedom, and they want income potential. It's like, okay, this is the path to doing that, right? It's not just make another post on Instagram. And Dean and I have like, you know, ragged on social media a little bit here. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but that's not the main event. It's right. the icing on the cake, right? You got to build the cake before you put the icing on it. And that's what this is all and about. You need all the ingredients. I think it's Elon Musk that says when you bake a cake, you got to make sure you have all the ingredients in the right percentage of yeah. ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, so awesome to have you on the show, Michelle. Uh, for those of you guys you. who are listening, please make sure that you go and grab a copy of the book, exitrichbook.com, um, and get your hands on all the extra goodies that Michelle's throwing in there, which is kind of mind-blowing that they're there. So get them while they're available. And um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, Michelle. Dean and I are going to go to a super quick commercial break. We're going to be back and we're going to wrap up the show. Thank you all so much for having me. My main website, I just want to say, is SalarTucker.com. Got it. Okay. Thank we'll you. make sure that's in the show notes. Thanks Thank so much. You, gentlemen. I had a blast. Okay. Thank we you. did too. Take care. All right, you guys, we're interrupting this incredible episode to bring you a very important announcement. And that announcement is the new Just the Tips members area. What? What? <laughs> We've created a members area that has trainings right out of the gate from Dean and I on our best strategies to help you grow your business and Many of our guests that we've had on the show have offered to put some of their best stuff inside the members area to help you guys have access to all sorts of content that'll help you grow your marketing, grow your sales, make sure you're staying on top of your business and you can work on your business, not in your business, get more results in less time. I can't even, like the reason you don't even hear Dean right now is he's galloping around the studio on his horse from sheer excitement. Dean, can you please stop galloping for one second and tell our good-natured listeners what's going on? Whoa there, horse. So, uh, <laughs> so if I can slow this thing down, there's only one place you got to go to get all this good stuff, and that is jttshow.com. That's jttshow.com. It's all free, and I think you're going to love it. We will see you guys on the inside of the new Justin Tibbs members area, jttshow.com. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. All right, so we got like three minutes before Doug's going to kick us off the air, but I wanted to just like extend that interview a little bit because I thought it was so valuable for everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, like what what's your biggest takeaway from that conversation we just had? For me, just the, the, the simple aspect of actually just like stopping and saying, okay, where are we at right now? Mm-hmm. Where do we actually want to be? Like what is the plan, the end destination? And then formulating the plan to actually take us there and orchestrating, you know, everything that you do and all the efforts that you make, all the investments and reinvestments into the business is feeding into that, that journey. Yeah. Yeah. That, that for me was, was huge. Cause I think, you know, take me, I'm like, oh yeah, we started this company. I've got this goal one day to sell for like X amount, but that's about as far as it's gone. It's like, oh yeah, they like the dream. Mm -hmm. it, where's the plan then? We're as a plan. We're operating like day to day, week to week. But really, it needs to be like, no, the plan should be to deliver upon this. I thought that was great. It's, and it's 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 obvious as well, yet it's not. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the just the reminder about the end game or yes. like what's the end game here. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's so easy to get caught in the day to day. It's so easy to get caught in like all the different things that have to happen in order to run the business. You it's easy to forget that the business is an entity. The business can be an asset. You can turn it into an asset and that's what you're working on building towards. And, um, and so I love, uh, I love her idea about the, you know, sort of like the annual valuation checkup, you know, like yeah. where, are, where are we relative to our progress? Um, I think that's, uh, that's super important. And so, uh, yeah, I was, I had a, I had a great time. I think we had some other stuff planned for today. 
Um, but I think uh, having having a few extra minutes on that interview was uh, was the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners to this that are like, oh, my gosh, I'm nowhere near this point yet of even thinking about it and even think about selling a business or, you know, whatever. But now, hopefully, it's just like like you said at the beginning, some awareness on the subject. Maybe you're yeah. not maybe you're not at that stage yet. Maybe you literally have, don't even have an idea yet. You're at zero. Like now you can think about it as you move forwards, you know, and for somebody like you or I, James, that's necessary. OK, we're already up and running. Got business is great. Did I take these necessary steps before? If I didn't, let me just step back a second and figure this out. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so, uh, so we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you guys for putting up with my uh, my shoddy background today. I was um, disappointed. I know, I know. You were shot. You were upset that I was here today. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but thank you to all our listeners for uh, for tuning in for another great show of Just Tips. We appreciate you guys. Shout out to our special guests or our special listeners in Zhang Zhao. What's up, you guys? And um, we will uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of Just Tips. James P. Friel signing off. My co-host, Mr. Dean Holland. And we will talk with you guys later. See you, everybody. Later. Thanks for tuning in to Just the Tips, where we believe business should be profitable and fun. For show notes, links, and other information on our guests, visit justthetipsshow.com. For more information on how to connect with Dean Holland, visit deanholland.com. And if you'd like to go from being a hustling entrepreneur to an effective CEO, capable of running your company without being stuck in the day-to-day, visit me for free training and resources at jamesbfreel.com. Our theme music is Happy Happy Game Show by Kevin McLeod. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License.